real life incident that we encountered on the bus. Uh, we saw a young man with a straw hat, uh, had a small uh, quarrel with a middle aged man. And then uh, later on, we saw the same young man uh, exchange a few words with his friend on the street, something about his button that he played. So it's an extremely mundane and pointless story that has nothing in the way of storytelling resolution or narrative. And he decided to write it 99 times in mm -hmm. different styles. Um, basically as an exercise to get out of the necessity to compose a story that has premise, and mm -hmm. subtext and so forth. Um, he also did loads of other bizarre books, uh, like 100,000 million poems, mm -hmm. uh, which is a book that was cut like this, and uh, you can flip it randomly and it come up with a poem. Uh, there's now a digital version of that. So um, he was a huge influence on me, and uh, a lot of his followers, um, particularly George Craig, I think was also the slideshow. Mm -hmm. um, if you press the next button, uh, this is your small This is the focus for the time. Anyway, that's uh, his interpretation of that very same story, but in comics form. So it sounds like there's a theme here that I think appears through the influences that you list, uh, where people are sort of examining rules specifically. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm never interested in uh, telling in stories that have a very distinct point to them. Uh, I'm much more interested in putting some constraints to myself and living to myself, and then through the failure to meet them, usually something emerges that you're not quite aware of. Uh, usually that is uh, a question rather than an opinion or a resolution or something like that. Uh, so that approach appeals to me a lot. Uh, there's a comics version of the book called Mbappo, which is predominantly French, and there's only one English member, that's Matt Adam, who wrote uh, a few uh, great instructor books on cartooning. Um, he also did an adaptation of uh, Exercise in style called 99 Ways to Tell a Story, in which it's an autobiographical sort of anecdote about him think, picking a cup from some fridge. Or mm -hmm. And he also draws it in a superhero style, in the manga, and so forth. Um, but in my own work, uh, you know, I have a pretty hard time starting anywhere. So I would usually set myself up in a weird or some room and try to follow it and see what comes out there. Next one. I will do an example of that in this period in which um, well, I can't actually read it or <laughs> <laughs> But basically, um, I just can't remember being quite upset about something and writing several pages. Do you have that the so you see what the. No, no, no. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> just some dribble about myself in, in a sketchbook.
truly great for us that improvise a story that would fit into it. And um, as the story is about putting the great together, so uh, here you can see that this character is at a party trying to fit in and what this one particular gets strong. So kind of that was the vision in the first row. Then it expanded the second and then it's shaped from overlapping. And uh, finally, I think the last one is supposed to be a hangover. Anyway, it's all a bit of fun. <laughs> Do you consider yourself more a visual artist, more a storyteller, or something? No, 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 I'm not visual at all. I mean, I always write obvious first. And that's why I'm a couple of people. Can close the back door there, please? Thank you. So, I think there's one more uh, about that. This one's called Yoga Detective. Yes, Yoga Detective. Right. <laughs> so, folks who are at the reading on Thursday, this is one of the ones that we've read. Is about a detective who uses yoga to solve crimes. Yeah, uh, well, Sophia and my wife recommend to yoga at some point. And uh, I my, hey, my natural on? reaction to all of this Bourdieu stuff that she introduces to my life is something like that. Um, an attempt to make sense of it, I suppose. So for this also, I built a great first without any, um, any concept of the story behind it. Then I wrote a real long story and then condensed it into this. So, you know, the bits of corporate references that you were referring to. Again, it's, it's mainly just fun. Can you get into this one a little bit, little bit deeper? Like, why detective in the first place? Like, why did you arrive with yoga and detective? No, why? Um, well, it just made no sense to me. Um, <laughs> I, I like taking words that feel uh, completely meaningless and then trying to attach them. Before that, I did a lot of stories about a character called the Psycho Detective. Mm -hmm. And that's something that uh, I was just sitting in the park and thinking what would be the most pointless, absurd TV show that I could think of that would be a Psycho Detective. You see, immediately those who did it, there is nothing. And that, that to me it just spoke of such futility. It felt really at home and lovely. Um, so that, that's similar. <laughs> I don't know how many detectives I'm going to do in the future, but there's also a way to visit it. The same book that this appears in, there's one in the end that's just a very short second called uh, Sidekick Defective. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that one is pretty blatantly on the background. Anyway, this is from Kimmel's uh, first novel called Which Press that is decided to adapt into the little script. Which? Is this in one of the books that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so, maybe. I don't remember. But, uh, yeah, just to the text straightforward and uh, something that is from different parts of the book. I don't know why. I just really like that passage. <laughs> you need something similar with your book of illustrations of Talbot Coffee, huh? Yeah, yeah. And I think it's later on the, the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so this... This curious man is George Perry. This was one of my favorite writers, and he uh, was a friend of you know, some follower. Um, he wrote uh, an amazing novel called Life Uses Manual, um, which appeals to me at all the levels. Uh, it's incredibly strange uh, to the degree that some constraints can be translated into English, just because big novels is in French. Um, in general, it's a story of a man who decides to spend the uh, several years of his life to learn painting and go to various places in the world and paint uh, landscapes there and compose jigsaw puzzles out of them, uh, disassemble them and reassemble them and then ship them to the places where he painted them and have them destroyed, therefore reducing everything to nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, it's a story of a failure and he fails at doing that mm -hmm. and he, he doesn't get to Finish his project. Um, to me, that you know, it seems like an amazing metaphor for any human endeavor. Um, but he also wrote a, a really fascinating dream diary uh, called The uh, Deep Obscure, which uh, was translated by my friend Daniel Little Becker and uh, actually left the title untranslated. Because uh, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. 
sense in English, it sounds like the dark shelf, right? But it kind of sounds nicer in French. We don't know what it means. Um, his approach to writing down dreams was really interesting to me. It uh, would be uh, very straightforward, but then uh, just the way he would use language. Um, it, it's, uh, I think Sambo described it as his uh, nocturnal autobiography. So the next one I did, uh, well, I, I drew quite a few of my dreams, but they could show that they're pretty dumb and very funny. Um, so this is one of the things that I did, and uh, again, I constrained myself into drawing this spiral first. As uh, uh, pretty much all my dreams are about dying in some dull way. It's <laughs> really tedious, it's not exciting.
using this extremely commercial imagery for it, mm -hmm. uh, push to the limits of the boundaries, uh, just adds a next level to it. Because he did work with the back of America and so forth, and it's a real person mm -hmm. drawn in this cartoon style. It's very unnerving. You see some of this in like, um, not so much comics that were in Playboy, but comics that were in like Playboy's like low rent competitors, where there were comic artists working in the 70s who things were not going well yeah. for them, but they knew they could get, as one of my friends said, a lot of the cartoons seemed to be drawn by someone who was losing his mind, but knew he could mm -hmm. get 50 bucks if he could just put a dick into this comic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, he seems to imitate this really well. I think he also in his interviews talks of his uh, um, sister who had some sort of mental disorder that would, uh, I don't remember what, what exactly it is, but um, she would have kind of involuntary wordplay. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so part of it is intellectual and part of it is just uh, an exposure to someone whose mind he couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. This is one of yours again? Uh, yeah, this is mine. This was from a letter that I got in the place where I worked. It was uh, about office gossip. It was written in a really weird style, and I just uh, cut this a bit. The drawings kind of, you know, to rent out my anger. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, yeah. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, this is a style you actually don't, don't see very often, where most of the time your panels are yeah. full color, full backgrounds. Well, I'm even though they're not fully rendered, the whole thing is there. Yeah, um, I'm trying to steer away from it. I'm trying to get everything nice and polished. This is something I do for my commercial work, and I don't have a lot of interest in that. Mm -hmm. And this? Yes, it's a Well, it's working out great, okay? Not. Uh, can you go back for us? Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is the uh, collaboration that I did with. Jar, who is uh, also alive, and mm, interesting. I think we really like him, despite <laughs> <laughs> his good health. Uh, he's a Montreal artist that I really admire. Um, he draws in a, I shouldn't actually include some of his stuff. Anyway, <laughs> he draws in a very loose manner with a pencil. And when I was in Montreal, I decided to collaborate on this thing that uh, basically one of us would draw a character. I think that he drew the one of the right first. And then I would redraw it um, kind of flipped really fast. Mm -hmm. And I drew the character he would redraw it. So we went like that about ten times. So the, um, the characters that we get them look kind of same like the originals. Mm -hmm. We'll be pretty far away. But he made this animation that would morph them into each other. Uh, so that was a really interesting exercise mm -hmm. in exploring each other's style and so forth. Um, actually, while we're talking about characters, one question I want to ask you that there wasn't really a foundation for in the slides, is that you used the character of the rabbit a lot? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's supposed to be a cat, but... Oh. <laughs> she told me it was a rabbit. You <laughs> my Yeah, that's, that's a psychic detective, actually. Uh, he's kind of a just placeholder character. Um, yeah, uh, I don't have a lot of characters as such. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't like character development plot. Makes no sense to me. Uh, it feels really unrealistic. I mean, people could tell me that my stuff is surreal, but I feel it's much more realistic than you know, a lot of uh, kind of escaped comics you read, mm -hmm. where people have dialogues, for instance. But mm -hmm. that doesn't happen in real life. Mm -hmm. People have monologues that go one after the other, but I don't think people actually talk. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not weird. Uh, well, that's the reason why sitcoms and a lot of soap operas, they feel extremely unrealistic because there's a very logical connection between each line. You know? mm -hmm. Like, it, it's clearly written by one person saying, okay, well, this guy says this, and she would reply like that, but she would do that, wouldn't she? Um, it just doesn't happen like that. Mm -hmm. People keep pushing their own stuff, and you can't really simulate several voices like that. Not people do it often feel very fake. Mm -hmm. um, so what I do is entirely one voice, and I make it very plain and obvious mm -hmm. that it's uh, 
one person speak with different you know, imaginary friends. Do you watch a lot of television? I ask because yeah. there are like three different TV shows about psychic detectives. I did Google it. Okay. <laughs> wow, this actually exists. Because you know, when I came up with it, I said, no one could possibly make it. They're all terrible. It makes stuff. no sense. Yeah. What did you just start? Okay, you were the killer. Um, yeah, there's, I think there's an anime or something like that. And, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't think I'll have a lawsuit. So if you if you watch a lot of TV, but you also hate sitcom plots, well, I don't watch TV that I don't like. Mm -hmm. like no, there's only one line that I actually have to mm -hmm. go through hours of crap TV to find them. But no, I'm, I'm really influenced, I guess, by a lot of um, comedy goes Armand Bellucci and uh, Chris Morris mm -hmm. and those guys who really pushed the boundaries in the 90s. I mm -hmm. don't see a lot of that. I mean, they, they still do stuff. You still like, you're talking about like in the loop uh, Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's a little more political and right. grounded. His early stuff was uh, really strange. And, um, you know, those, again, this mix of very quotidian, boring things and this surreal approach. Mm -hmm. He would just talk in the middle of sketch. And, like, mm -hmm. This is a photo of me and my kids who went to Disneyland and they had a casual Friday. So here we're greeted by Mickey Mouse, and it's just a man standing like that with his everyday clothes. And then, you know, it's not really a joke, you just put it past it that, mm -hmm. and then go home. I really like that. Um, you know, my favorite humor is, is not feed line, punch line, mm -hmm. but something that just feels a bit incongruous and makes you a bit startled. Mm -hmm. And it's inherently humorous, uh, but not something that induces laughter as a reaction. Right. So, Actually, it raises an interesting point. It's Chris Morris, who had the show Brass Eye yeah. uh, for a long time. Um, most recently, like his most recent poem is Four Lions. The folks have seen that, which is a wacky but pretty realistic and humanist comedy about four um, Muslim terrorists in Britain who arrange a bombing. Yeah, or well, humanist is the right word yeah. to use. Uh, I think what really makes it stand out among all such comedies is the the compassion that he has for these people. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people view him as like a cynical, uh, slightly controversial monstrous figure. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, he had this really controversial episode of pedophilia, but if you really pay attention, uh, it's not at all make a part of the subject. Mm -hmm. and if you deal with something like that, it's extremely easy to get misinterpreted. I very much in my mind, it doesn't stop, it doesn't um, water down the stuff, and take any compromises. Do you think it's natural progression of folks who are doing really absurd, absurdist comedy to eventually move into doing comedy about politics, where like lives and death are at stake? Well, I don't uh, know. I think they, they grow up, and right. that's something um, I haven't entirely yet experienced. You know, other than mm -hmm. have children. Thing is that something you notice in Chris Ware and the uh, town clubs, the, the subject matter and the general approach changes dramatically. Mm -hmm. They still have. When they have kids, you mean? Yeah, uh, you know, if you compare, like, about Come on, Buff, Captain Iron with uh, Wilson, mm -hmm. you still yeah, have this so. general weirdness about him. Uh, the subject matter is so dramatically different. The same as Chris Ware, of course. They lose the shadow of this. I 
feel like having a kid means that you have to care about something other than yourself oh, yeah. for the first time. Yeah, so like Louis C.K. or Chris Honestad, I think it's Louis. This is Raymond Russell, uh, who is not a huge influence on me, but who I was very fascinated by. Was a bizarre, as it says here, writer. <laughs> he was a neighbor of Proust. Uh, he was inordinately uh, rich and had a incredible lifestyle, he never worked in his life. Uh, he died of a drug overdose. He had a car that I think I had a month of for the slide that was a um, great envy of Mussolini and the Pope. And uh, it, it was pre pretty much the first RV in history. Oh, wow. He lived in it. Uh, he was, I think, probably definitely insane. Uh, he would work one hour each day, but he would set it on a clock from one to two. He would spend about a week writing one sentence, for instance. He wrote very little, and uh, he had this uh, strange Miguel manual. And he wrote very strange stuff, which I'll talk in a second. Mm -hmm. But you know, one of his uh, famous quotes is that one day I will outlive Bonaparte and Victor Hugo. Like, oh, what I found really different about him is that unlike a lot of uh, people who do kind of weird stuff and know their place, so to speak, uh, he genuinely believed that he's making great art that should be consumed by everyone and loved by the masses. Which, if you read the first great <laughs> so basically, uh, he was mainly known as a, an eccentric Parisian figure throughout his life. And then he was rediscovered by a uh, surrealist and then by a canon company, who took them him but in different ways. The surrealist is quite weird. Mm -hmm. And uh, canon, because after his two books, which is not a lot in life now, he wrote a book called How I Wrote Some of My Books, <laughs> <laughs> which is a fascinating title. In which he explains how he wrote them, but apparently there was this insane system that he came up with. For instance, for each chapter, he would start with a sentence and then he would rearrange something uh, kind of randomly and then write the middle. Mm -hmm. And in this uh, escalated system, he had uh, plots like uh, the characters would walk around and there would be a field that is covered with little T's and then there is a machine that is propelled by uh, movements of air that bring these teeth in different degrees of roughness to compose a mosaic of teeth. Mm -hmm. And then there's a story behind the mosaic of teeth in which there's a barbarian and a cave reading a book. And then there's a story about that book. Mm -hmm. So there's this kind of spiraling into madness. And reading this book is really strange. Um, some describe it as proof of dreams, which I think is really true in, in the sense that he almost has no plot at all. Uh, his uh, famous novel, Locus Solus, is just wandering around uh, and looking at stuff. It has no ending and nothing. Um, so on the next slide, I think there's some illustrations from his um, equally bizarre novel, um, The Impressions yeah. of Africa, mm -hmm. in which there's practically no mention of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I really like that he picked this very normal sounding title. You know, uh, it could be attributed to a, one of those travel diaries that were really popular at the time. Um, the kind of stuff that Leopold Bloom reads. You know. mm -hmm. um, but instead of that, there's one paragraph about the sultry heat in Africa, and then there's just complete madness for like 400 pages. <laughs> uh, and a lot of his stuff that he came up with eventually uh, came to life. Uh, he, he sort of had like, an iPad of sorts, <laughs> and then uh, there is a version of a digital camera uh, that paints on the canvas. Like, you know, he was a demented genius. <laughs> so I'm doing a bad job moderating here because we have like 30 slides to get through okay, in the next let's, seven let's, minutes. Let's, <laughs> let's count for that. And uh, yeah, that's one of his theatrical things. <sighs> is this his RV? Yeah. Um, he has a custom built <laughs> So some art inspired by him. Uh, that's something that I drew based on a cog in one of the stories, the bonded art. 